More than 27,000 people were displaced in Colombia during the first quarter of this year, as the violence continues to escalate in the country. In Brazil, a parliamentary inquiry began into possible negligence and the use of federal funds by the government of President Jair Bolsonaro in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov received his Mexican counterpart Marcelo Ebrard in Moscow. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm Gladys Quesada. More than 27,000 people were displaced in Colombia during the first quarter of this year, as the violence continues to escalate in the country. The Colombian Human Rights Ombudsman revealed that the amount of people displaced so far this year represents an increase of 177 percent as compared to the same period last year. People have been forced from their homes amid th threats, assassinations and massacres, forced recruitment by armed gangs and clashes between armed groups in areas without a strong state presence, the Ombudsman said on Monday. The United Nations has condemned the endemic violence in the country, noting an intensification as well as increased territorial and social control by non-state armed groups and criminal groups in its annual report. The International Committee of the Red Cross also said in March that Colombia was facing at least five continued conflicts with armed groups that were affecting the daily lives of Colombians. I am an adult and I am a mother, and for me this displacement was a very hard thing because it is a very big uprooting of so many years with the civilian population. To live with children and arrive in these conditions to this place, we do not know where we are going to sleep. The president of Chile, Sebastián Piñera, enacted the law that allows the third withdrawal of 10% of the pension funds privatized during the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. Piñera signed the law after the Constitutional Court rejected his attempt to block the initiative, with seven votes in favor and three against. This will be the third withdrawal allowed since the beginning of the pandemic, a measure that has been perceived by the Chilean people as a palliative to face the crisis caused by COVID-19. The Constitutional Court's decision came amidst popular pressure that ratified support for the law promoted by the opposition. Uruguayan school transport owners protested in front of the presidential palace on Tuesday to demand tax exemptions and more government credits for their business, which has been paralyzed by school closures and distance learning implemented in the country due to the pandemic. And we have nothing to eat. We have nothing to eat. We don't have any way to pay. So if the government doesn't help us, school transportation dies. We need a small solution, something something. If not, we don't have how to pay. Simple. China's top lawmaker, Li Sanzu, held virtual talks with the president of Venezuela's National Assembly, Jorge Rodriguez, this Tuesday, during which the two sides agreed to strengthen exchange and cooperation between their respective legislative bodies. Li Sanzu stated that China is willing to strengthen relations with the Venezuelan parliament and implement the agreements reached by the leaders of the two countries. He also said that China is working to maintain exchanges at all levels, enhance policy coordination and advance in the construction of the Belt and Road Initiative. The Chinese legislator also pledged to step up exchanges in culture, education and technology and also to reinforce cooperation to contain the COVID-19 pandemic. Meanwhile, Jorge Rodriguez expressed gratitude for China's support and assistance in the fight against the pandemic. He also said that the Venezuelan National Assembly stands ready to strengthen and contribute to the comprehensive strategic partnership between the two nations. The attorneys for the family of a black man killed by police in North Carolina, Andrew Brown Jr., stressed on Tuesday that the autopsy shows he died of a gunshot wound to the back to the head. 
Protesters have taken to the streets of Elizabeth City for the past week over Brown's fatal shooting by officers executing a search warrant. Relatives said that according to an autopsy they commissioned, he died from the bullet that struck his neck as he tried to drive away from several police officers who shot him five times. The family described the killing as an execution and demanded that all police body camera video be released. Officials in Elizabeth City, home to near 20,000 people, declared a state of emergency and ordered a curfew in anticipation of possible protests over the latest death of an African-American at the hands of the police. My pops, man. Yesterday, I said he was executed. This autopsy report showed me that was correct. That this, in fact, was a fatal wound to the back of Mr. Brown's head as he was leaving the site trying to evade being shot at by these particular law enforcement officers who we believe did nothing but a straight out execution. It's important to note that the projectile was recovered in his brain. It never exited in the trajectory. Attorney Daniels was from bottom to top, left to right, back to front. So it went into the base of the neck, in the bottom of the brain, the skull, and got lodged in his brain. The Spanish government has condemned death threats against ministers after several top leftist politicians received a bullet and a knife in the past. Tourism Minister Reyes Maroro said on Monday she had received a knife covered in red stains days after the leader of the left-wing Podemos party, Pablo Iglesias, as well as the interior minister and the head of the civil guard, received threatening letters containing bullets. The threats, believed to have come from far-right groups, come ahead of the regional elections in Madrid, to be held on May the 4th, in which Pablo Iglesias is running for regional president. Outgoing pre regional leader of Madrid, Isabel Díaz Ayuso, of the Conservative Popular Party accused the left of trying to use the threats for political gain. It's not intimidation against ministers, senior officials or public officials will succeed in weakening the deep democratic convictions that shape this government. The government wishes to unreservedly express its concern about the climate of tension, the climate of confrontation and incitement to hatred promoted by those political groups which creates a breeding ground for the normalization of absolutely reprehensible situations that should require the unanimous condemnation without any kind of nuance and all social actors. And we'll be right back after this very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. In Brazil, a parliamentary inquiry began this Tuesday into possible negligence and the use of federal funds by the government of President Jair Bolsonaro in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. The creation of a parliamentary commission to investigate claims regarding the disastrous and potentially criminal response to a COVID-19 pandemic that has killed nearly 400,000 Brazilians was requested by opposition Senator Randolfe Rodriguez, who explained that the intention is to investigate the actions and the omissions of the federal government. The commission will evaluate criminal negligence in the purchase of vaccines, the minimizing of the severity of the pandemic, the lack of incentives to adopt restrictive measures, the promotion of treatments without proven scientific evidence, as well as President Bolsonaro's responsibility in the lack of attention to address the environmental crisis in the Amazon and the genocide of indigenous communities. Governor of the Brazilian state of Ceará, Camilo Santana, described the politicization of the use of COVID-19 vaccines as unacceptable in reference to the health regulatory agency's decision to ban the use of Sputnik V in Brazil.
The agency claimed the decision was based on alleged al lack of documentary evidence of the vaccine's safety and the possibility of flaws in its manufacture, despite the fact that the Russian-developed vaccine was the target of an international smear campaign for months. It has now been approved for use in 61 countries and shown efficacy of 97.6% based on the analysis of data from 3.8 million vaccinated Russian citizens. In Bolivia, eight mass vaccination sites were inaugurated in the cities of La Paz and El Alto in order to begin vaccinating citizens aged over 60. COVID-19 has been gradual, according to the arrival of vaccines and their availability, but I think we are going to be able to vaccinate the entire population over the course of time. It is very important for the population to have access to the vaccine so they can make informed decisions but it is entirely up to the individual. No one can say get vaccinated or don't get vaccinated. It is a personal decision. The Mexico, hard hit by COVID-19, has been experiencing a drop in the number of deaths and hospitalizations for the, f for the past two and a half months, in contrast to other countries in the region that are suffering a new wave of contagions. After a deadly start of the year, the country shows an encouraging outlook, highlighted by, on Tuesday by President Andrés Manuel López Obrador, who overcame the disease in February. The epidemic and the good news that we have 14 consecutive weeks of declines in the estimated number of new infections, deaths and hospitalizations. Out of 100 people who get tested for COVID in Mexico City, today we are at 7.5 percent. That is, 7.5 are positive, the lowest number since the pandemic began. We share. In the Netherlands, the eastern city of Arnhem saw large protests on Tuesday to demonstrate against the government and lockdown measures. City officials urged people to stay away from the area as protesters marched through the city chanting slogans like We are the Netherlands and love, freedom, no dictatorship. According to reports, the demonstration remained peaceful and was monitored by a large police presence with, ended with organizers thank thanking officers and the city's mayors. Portugal's national state of emergency will end in the coming days. President Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa announced that the decree that grants the government the legal powers to impose lockdowns will not be extended into the coming month. During the experts in the morning, during the afternoon the parties with the sitting parliament and throughout these weeks the government, all of this led me to decide not to extend the state of emergency. I took this decision based on the stable situation, the lower mortality rate, the lower number of people in intensive care and onwards, as well as the transmission rate reduction spread indicator, also the number of infected on the pandemic impact. In Japan, government minister Kazuhiro Sugita stated on Wednesday that COVID countermeasures are the biggest holding the 2021 Tokyo Summer Olympics. Japanese government is reviewing their studies for countermeasures as athletes and tournament officials arrive in the country. Local organizers and the International Olympic Committee push ahead with plans to open the postponed Tokyo Olympics in just under three months. The death toll in Japan from COVID reached 10,000, which is disturbing compared to other places in Asia such as Taiwan, Vietnam, Thailand or South Korea. And we have more stories coming up after the final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back from the South. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov his Mexican counterpart Marcelo Ebrard in Moscow. The visit that will conclude on Thursday includes discussions on the diversification of the bilateral economic trade and investment relations. Regarding the fight against the coronavirus pandemic, the foreign ministers will discuss the possibility of Mexico joining the 
the vaccination campaign in the country. The ministry also announced that the visit of the Mexican foreign minister will reinforce the Eurasian nation's ties with regional integration associations, including the community of Latin American and Caribbean states. order a total of seven diplomats from three Baltic nations and Slovakia to leave the country as a reaction to their government's expulsions of Russian diplomats. Based on the principle of reciprocity, the foreign ministry demanded that two employees of the Lithuanian embassy, three employees of the Slovakian embassy, as well as one employee of the Latvian and one employee of the Estonian diplomatic mission to leave the territory of Russia within seven days. Last week, Slovakia expelled three Russian diplomats. Lithuania also expelled two Russian diplomats and Estonia and Latvia each ordered one Russian embassy out. While announcing its retaliatory moves, the Russian foreign ministry denounced the three Baltic nations for taking what it described as an openly hostile course against Moscow. It also noted that Slovakia's expulsions had hurt the traditional relations between the two countries. Wednesday, a formal investigation was launched by the Electoral Commission into how the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson funded refurbishments to his military department. The investigation will determine whether any transactions relating to the works in the apartment fall within the regime regulated by the Commission, and whether such funding was reported as required. The Commission, which regulates party and election finance, has the power to investigate if such funding has been declared properly and can impose fine or pass on allegations to the police if they see fit. While it is not against the rules to receive donations, politicians must declare them so that the public who has given them money and whether it has had any influence of their decisions. On Wednesday, the European Parliament has overwhelmingly voted to ratify the trade deal between the United Kingdom and the European Union. The trade and cooperation agreement, which has been in provisional effect since January, will come into force next month. The agreement was approved with 660 votes in favor to five against and 32 abstentions representing the last political hurdle for the accord. If the agreement has not passed, the UK and the US terms on trade will be created even further with rates and quotas applicable on goods. Meanwhile, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen welcomed the deal's approval but stated that the faithful implementation is essential. Japan's parliament approved Japan's integration to the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement signed by 16 countries in the Asia-Pacific region. The agreement is made up of the 10 member countries of the Association of the Southeast Asian Nations, Asian, together with China, Japan, South Korea, Australia and New Zealand, and East Coast largest free trade agreement in the world. The agreement covers an area with around 2.2 billion consumers and approximately 30% of the gross domestic product, around $26.2 trillion. The signatories hope that the free trade bloc will be a boost for pandemic hit economies across the region by progressively passing out 90% of the tar tariffs parts between sectors, as well as organizing multi country supply chains and codifying new e commerce rules. A Burkina Faso Air Force plane will repatriate to Spain the bodies of David Berrien and Roberto Fraile, the two journalists killed during an attack by an army group while they were filming a documentary on Poshin. Sources from the Ministry of Defense have detailed that the Air Force already has a plane ready to proceed with the repatriation as soon as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs informs them that all the formalities have been completed. The bodies of the two reporters have been taken to the capital of Burkina Faso for the autopsy. A representative of the Spanish embassy in Mali has gone there to collaborate and be in contact with their families. On Tuesday, Egypt's Tourism and Antiquities Ministry announced that archaeologists had 
unearthed 110 ancient tombs in the Nile Delta. The tombs, some of which have human remains inside, were found at an archaeological site in Dakalia province, northeast of the capital Cairo. They include 68 oval-shaped tombs dating back to the pre-dynastic period. Also found were 37 rectangular-shaped tombs from an ancient era known as the Second Intermediate Period of Egypt. Archaeologists also found human remains of adults and children and funerary equipment and pottery objects in the tombs. This marks the latest in a series of archaeological discoveries in recent years and represents a chance to revive the country's tourism sector badly impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. And while diplomatic attempts of reapprochement continue in Vienna, tensions rise in the Persian Gulf. On Tuesday, the Pentagon stated that two of its ships fire warning shots in the face of an alleged approach by Iranian ships. Regarding the military maneuver, Iran's parliament speaker Mohammad Baker Qalibaf said that the presence of foreign troops in the region led by the United States disrupts security and destroys economic opportunities in the region, creating a gap between the south and the north of the Persian Gulf. The U.S. alleged that after multiple communication attempts and radio warnings, bridge to bridge, the crew of the Firebolt ship fired warning shots at the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and Navy ships. The Pentagon report stated that the coastal fast attack ships breached the security of the other vessels. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.